Okay, so let's start the recording. Um, uh, so thank you for joining the session of the virtual seminars in economic theory. Uh, today we have Jan Urgun, who is going to present uh, collective progress and dynamics of exit waves together with Doruk Tetemann and uh, Leat Yariv. And uh, we're very pleased to have as guest panelists Ariada Bardi and Heiki Rantakari. Uh, the format of this seminar is as follows. Uh, we're going to have a 60-minute 60 uh, 60-minute uh, presentation with time for interim questions from the panelists, uh, followed by a 15-minute session for questions and discussion. Uh, we request all attendees to keep your microphones muted during the talk. However, please post comments and questions in the chat. There will be an opportunity to ask questions live in the Q&A session at the end. And uh, the talk is uh, recorded. Uh, before I hand over to Jan, let me remind you that these seminars take place every Thursday at 4 p.m. UK time. Next uh, week, we're going to have with us uh, Vasiliki Skreta, who's going to talk to us about the information design by an informed designer with Frederick Kessler. And the guest panelists are Simone Galberti and Thomas Straker. As usual, you can find more information on our website or by following us on Twitter. Uh, thank you, Jan. The mic is yours. Uh, thank you so much once again for organizing the talk and uh, having me as a guest. Uh, as Piro mentioned, uh, today I'll be talking about collective progress, dynamics of exit waves. Uh, the motivation for this paper is actually fairly simple. Uh, many economic decisions usually are uh, preceded by a process of search. And this process is more often than not done as a collaborative uh, effort. Examples could be policy experimentation, R&D joint ventures, startups where multiple agents are doing some search together, and maybe the implementation is done separately. A good real life example of such a scenario would be the uh, partnership for a new generation of uh, vehicles, which ran in US from 93 to 201. And uh, it was about building the new generation of vehicles. It consisted of GM, Ford, uh, Chrysler, some universities, some federal agencies, and they worked on how to uh, come up with the new generation. And their research process was kind of a joint effort, but it was going in a particular order. For example, one of the innovations they came up with was a, a, a versions of new chassis material. And originally they started with like full steel. Eventually they run through, for example, adding a little bit of aluminum, a little more aluminum and more aluminum as they go through. And at every point in time, they chose how much they wanted to stress test these new materials that they created. During this process, at some point, uh, Chrysler decided they got a good enough uh, metal and used it in their truck bed for the Chevy Silverado. The other manufacturers didn't take this to heart, but in two years after, Ford actually used a slight variation of the uh, same metal to actually build the entire chassis of the Ford Explorer. So we have a few critical junctures within this kind of search process that we wanna focus on in this paper. First, uh, observations are correlated and they're uncertain. So if I'm working with some sort of compound today, I know what the compound tomorrow is going to be, but I don't know, for example, how durable it will be, how it will uh, stress test against fire, et cetera, et cetera. And search scope is a choice for all of the uh, searchers. Like GM might be testing how it will turn, how the metal will work in, for example, tumbling accidents, whereas Ford might be just saying, okay, this is light enough for me. I'm just gonna put it in a truck bed and call it a day. So they just, choose their search scope individually, but the total tests done on a particular metal is actually a result of all of the uh, participants' efforts. And in order to capture these common features, uh, we're going to use two main components. First, we're going to capture the uncertainty and correlation by uh, thinking of a path of a Brownian motion. So the ideas, the prospects are going to be correlated over time. Today, I see some sort of uh, uh, compound material. Tomorrow, I'm just changing the copper content slightly. So it's going to be on average expected to be the same. But 
uh, it might of course have much better properties or worse properties. And when the agents stop their search, they are not required to actually implement what is the current project they are uh, searching on. They can actually go back and say, we had found this, com uh, this compound that worked great as a truck bed and implement that one, even though the test might have been done six months ago. The second component is the search scope is going to be a joint control of costly variance. You can think of it as the extent or the scope of the tests that you're running as you do the search. And of course, higher scopes are going to be associated with higher costs. The goal of this paper is to try to understand how search is going to unfold over time. But this might be a little bit of a loaded statement. So let me break down a little bit. First, we want to understand how the search scope is going to vary as a function of search outcomes. The search outcomes are what are the observations we have had so far, as well as what is the best outcome we have had. That is my outside option if we were to implement my best idea we have had so far. And it turns out actually surprisingly, uh, the search scope of each individual agent is going to be constant and it is going to only depend on who is doing the search with them. So if for example, Ford, GM and Chrysler are doing their search and they found a new metal that's going to conduct electricity, super light, et cetera, the search scope they choose is going to be the same if they were just uh, trying to uh, make a car out of coal. So their search scope is going to be only dependent on who is doing the search. The second is how are the exit decisions made? Why did, for example, uh, Chrysler decided to come up with the truck bed, whereas the other ones actually continued on the compounds? How did Ford decide now they had a good uh, uh, metal to actually build a chassis out of? And it turns out first, there will be a deterministic exit sequence. So ex ante, we would be able to say that, you know what, the first person to stop their search would be G, uh, Chrysler, then it would be followed by Ford, then it would be followed by GM before the start of the uh, entire search. Second, the stopping decisions we will be able to characterize as a rather simple stopping boundary, which is going to be also useful for us to understand the exit waves. Who is going to, for example, why would for uh, universities quit together or some universities quit together from this partnership, whereas government agencies did not join them. We would be able to pinpoint that exactly using a rather simple stopping boundary. And finally, we wanna ask, since this is a, a collaborative search, if this is efficient. In order to do that, we asked what would a social planner do instead of these agents acting in equilibrium. And we find that the social planner would actually like the agents to search longer and with higher search scopes during the entire search process. And second, the social planner will also implement a deterministic exit sequence, but that deterministic sequence might actually be different than what you would encounter in equilibrium. Now, I don't wanna spend a lot of time on the literature, but Searching on a Brownian path is not very new, and it's uh, kind of starting with Stephen Callender's earlier work. Uh, our difference is all of our agents are actually fully forward-looking as opposed to having myopic agents or uh, two-period living agents. Uh, we're working on uh, optimal stopping as groups and how they are uh, deciding to go through, but uh, instead of just experimentation or joint optimal stopping, we also incorporate search into it. And finally, even though we're not doing any kind of experimentation in the sense that we do not have an idea of something is good or bad before, but we have a full set of unknown outcomes, the techniques of using Brownian motion to actually capture search or experimentation is uh, related to the last bit of literature. Now, uh, in the upcoming time I have, first I'm going to uh, briefly describe the model and give you the ingredients of the story I have told. Then I will describe the equilibrium behavior. Then I will go on to the social planners problem. And hopefully if I have time, I will discuss a few extensions before concluding.
Now, let us get started with the model. Since we said time, uh, we're going to be using Brownian motion, our time is going to be continuous. And we start with N agents. Th those agents are deciding when to stop searching, which is a irreversible decision. So you can think of it as, I find the compound that I like. Now I'm going to actually build the proper machinery in my factory, and I go into a production with it and changing it to get into a new product, et cetera, is super costly to me. So costly that the stopping decision is actually irreversible. The second thing is the stopping decisions are independently done between the agents. So we need to keep track of who is doing the search. And the uh, wording that I will use is an alliance of the agents that are still continuing the search. So our full set of agents is going to be a zero, but as time goes on, we will have some subset of these agents as agents uh, conclude their search and leave. And continuing agents are jointly controlling the search by choosing the scope. So here we are taking a rather simple functional form that every agent is just summing up their parts of the scope that is the uh, variance of the Brownian motion at the point in time but clearly it's very easy to extend into any kind of continuous aggregation function that you can think of here. Since you're talking about the Brownian motion, obviously we need to start from somewhere and without loss, I'm going to assume we're starting from zero. So this is the basic search environment we have. Now on the agent side, agents are seeing the search process as it is controlled jointly for all of the uh, agents throughout the Alliance. And during their search, they choose how much they're going to uh, contribute by choosing a scope, which is a Sigma I, that comes from a compact interval that is bounded away from zero. Why bounded away from zero? That is, you cannot idle. If you're part of the search, you're doing something, maybe something very little, but it's not zero. Uh, the cost of search scope is going to be uh, pretty standard. We're going to map the search scope to some real number that are increasing, convex and continuously differentiable for each agent. And notably, we're making no assumptions that these agents are identical. In principle, those cost functions could vary uh, greatly across all other agents. And finally, we are going to add that the agents are going to be perfectly observing uh, each other's choices. So that uh, if I'm choosing a particular uh, search scope, then uh, the other uh, companies are also able to see that search scope in the sense that we are doing this alliance thing that's done by the government and we are actually have to share that uh, search outcomes along with the other firms. Now, with the agent side done, let me move on to the final bit of the problem, where we're going to talk about the maximum. Remember, as I said, uh, you are not restricted to actually implement the best idea, uh, not the current idea that you have or the current compound you have into your car. You can actually go back and see, okay, this particular compound was a very good candidate and you might wanna implement that. That is uh, going to require us to keep track of the running maximum of our search process, which is jointly controlled. And this is also uh, kind of tying into the fact that since you're doing search, you might be saying that you're doing search over a Brownian motion. What's the point? There is no drift. You expect the outcome to be the same tomorrow. But if you're keeping track of the maximum, actually the outcome you see tomorrow is increasing as your search scope increases. So it's more like a search. You might have some good outcomes today, bad outcomes tomorrow, but overall, as time goes on, the outcomes are going to increase as you increase your search scope. And finally, we are saying that when an agent stops, they're going to get the current maximum. So if I'm stopping right now, I decide, okay, my alliance can continue now, but I found a good enough compound and I'm just going to use it on truck beds because I don't think it's safe for the 
uh, individuals to use, I'm allowed to do that. And when I do that, I'm getting the maximum itself. Now you might say, why am I getting the maximum? If for example, uh, Chrysler invented the compound and I did a slight variation and put it on my Ford Jeep, uh, why am I getting the full maximum? You can actually add penalties for later exits. You might get lesser credit for actually uh, being the second, third, fourth uh, agents. Uh, but that I will discuss till the end, uh, in the end of the talk. For the majority of the talk, we are looking at the collaborative aspect. But to give a brief uh, uh, overview, the results are going to be, the search scopes are going to be fairly similar. Only the followers stopping decisions will slightly be altered, but generically the behavior is going to be fairly similar to the just collaborative outcome. Now, uh, now that we have the environment, we can talk about what an individual gets by participating in such a search. Uh, an agent I's total payoff is going to be the maximum at their time of stopping minus the accumulated cost. So we're accumulating flow costs throughout. And since the costs are positive, uh, we're going to stop at a finite time. Uh, the agent strategies in an environment like this has two components. First, there is the control part, which is the search scope that they have. Second, there is the stopping decision, which is the stopping decision. So we're essentially trying to solve a joint control and stopping decision over this uh, Brownian problem. However, since we also have heterogeneous agents as well, in order to get any kind of tractability, we need to make some assumptions on the set of strategies allowed. And the assumption we make is the, that we are going to be looking at Markov equilibria, so, uh, which is fairly standard in the literature, but has a little bit of a twist in this scenario, because unlike having a single Markov state, we actually have three Markov states on this problem. First is the alliance at time t, the subset of agents that are still continuing their search. Second is the observation of the current outcome, which is the controlled Brownian motion. So that one we actually have covered through. And third, we are going to have the maximum of the uh, current process. That is also moving through. Now the uh, alliance and the level at time xt are kind of familiar, but the maximum, let me try to illustrate uh, graphically just to have it in your mind. So our control Brownian is going to look like a Brownian no matter what you do. The variance might vary throughout, but it's going to look like something like this. The maximum is going to be always above the Brownian by definition, since it's the maximum. And there are two important things that I wanna highlight. It's usually flat. And the second thing is, even though you might see that it's looking like it's touching the black line here, in reality, it's just actually right below the black line. The times that we, where it's actually really touching is kind of an optical illusion that we see right here. And one thing you can actually infer from looking at this is to say that, well, in this problem, if I'm actually continuing the search at this point, continuing the search at this point sounds kind of commonsensical because all I have done is to give a flat payoff to the persons that have gone up. So that I will formalize a little bit later on, but just to keep in mind. Now, the stopping uh, decision, like the control of a Markov state is fairly easy. We are going to have a sigma i, that's a function of at, mt, and xt. The stopping decision we're going to say is going to come from a stopping boundary. And the stopping boundary is specific to the A as well as M, as well as X. So in principle, this is a way of writing a family of stopping times where we assume the stopping boundaries are below because you're never actually going to stop if you hit a new maximum. And it turns out restricting attention to 
uh, stopping boundaries of this form is without loss as long as all of the agents are actually willing to search alone. And notice, uh, I'm going to have these kind of stopping boundaries for an agent for all of the alliances that they can be in. So it's actually not a single tau i, but it's a full family of tau i uh, i a's for an individual to use as a stopping boundary. Now, again, this might be a little bit of a uh, alien concept. So let's illustrate a fairly simple one. The rule was stop when x is equal to some function of m. A simple function you can think is, what if g of m is a linear one? So on the left side, we see two linear curves where uh, if m is equal to, let's say, two, you want to stop uh, if your x is going to be equal to uh, zero. So you can actually see that the linear curve is just a line here. But once you put it over the path of the Brownian, you see it's going to actually follow through the maximum in the following fashion. Now you might have, okay, this is linear curves. What if there were nonlinear curves and like other curvature? Whenever the line is flat, no matter how curved your boundary is, it still has to be flat on the path itself as well. What's going to change if you have curved boundaries is the gap is going to shrink and increase as you go along. But it turns out actually, this is going to be a particularly interesting class, the linear stop boundaries. Sorry, okay. John, can I stop you there? Mm -hmm. um, yes. So I, I have a couple of questions on, on the modeling choices you've made here. So uh, first, uh, going back to the, I guess the first two slides of the model, when we think about this domain of the Brownian as the the, the terrain of, of correlated alternatives. Mm -hmm. um, there is a particular, it seems to me that this terrain is uh, sort of like directed search from left to right in which agents cannot skip over alternatives. And that seems to be sort of uh, a, a difference with calendars um, setup. So I'm, I'm, I'm wondering how should we interpret this idea that um, we, cannot, uh, uh, we cannot go back to, uh, we cannot skip over some alternatives and go back and revisit those regions later. Um, uh, so that, mm -hmm. or maybe I can ask my second one and then, uh, you yeah, know, I, I, mm -hmm. I'm also wondering about, you know, experimentation here is in terms of choosing the variance of the Brownian, but we could also think of, of the agents here contributing to the drift uh, uh, sort of jointly to the drift of the Brownian. So I'm wondering like, how does, this tie back to the example that you are giving. Um. So uh, going back to the relationship with calendar, uh, here, uh, just like the example I tried to give, you, you do actually have an order that you're going through from left to right. In the calendar case, it was just over the real line, you could actually jump through. So we're kind of going incrementally. One way to interpret this is to say, uh, unlike calendar case, there is no drift. So if you remove everything that you think is better or worse, where you think there is going to be a drift and you remove them and just line them up next to each other, you're going through different options. So if I'm thinking about creating some sort of metal, I might be thinking, okay, I'm going to have at least 50% steel inside. Then I'm going to have maybe 2% uh, aluminum, 3% aluminum, et cetera. But I know that if I make the entire thing out of aluminum, the car is just going to collapse on itself. So those bad ones I actually sort out and only the good ones I list. And I just go through them one by one since I actually don't have an expectation that one is better than the other, hence the driftlessness of the Brownian. Now, uh, jumping is in principle interesting, but that would have as a separate version of a cost function where instead of actually choosing the scope of the test, we also need to tie an additional cost function to say, okay, we know the previous ones, but now I need to think about uh, doing a radical experimentation as opposed to an incremental experimentation, uh, which could be an interesting part of future work, but in this paper, we don't deal with that. Yet. Now, thinking about drift, uh, in principle here, you're actually controlling the drift of the maximum 
by choosing the uh, variance at the point. So the payoff relevant process, if you think about it as the maximum, you are controlling the drift. Uh, otherwise, incorporating drift, uh, at least in the single agent version, is going to usually have a bang-bang solution. Since everything is fairly linear in here, you either choose an optimal drift and stick with it, like you fully search or you don't. Whereas in here, there is a little bit more going on. And uh, finally, we want to think of searches uh, like drift has the interpretation, if you think about it, just mere passage of time actually improves the outcomes you are going to see. So if I had the option to jump infinitely into the future, then if I had drift, I would actually want to do so. So you might want to think of this as this is the de-drifted one because the mere passage of time does not give you better search outcomes. You actually have to do the search throughout. Uh, may I also ask a quick question uh, on mm -hmm. the modeling choices? Um, actually, I the more I spent time with this, the more I appreciated the modeling choices you made uh, in, in terms of the creative process of coming up with things. But going back to sort of the motivational model of innovation, and I think you do it in a little bit in the paper, but maybe you can also do it in the presentation, tying this a little more also to the public goods literature and kind of reminded me of George Giorgiati's paper in Restart a few years back, where when you innovate, there's two different types of processes. One is kind of where you have the target quality that you need to meet, which is more, okay, we need to get a, to a value of 10 or we need to get to the value of 15 versus your version, which is much more open-ended where we're able to quit the process at any time and walk away with that. So just as a thought, you might wanna explore in what type of innovative environments one model might be better than the other to capture some of the dynamics. And also just as a challenge for you, since you are very technically competent, would you have the ability to marry these two, which is, does it help us if we actually set targets, we agree that we won't quit until we reach 10. And then we may decide if we explore after that, maybe we'll see what happens then, et cetera, et cetera. And then as a second challenge for that one is, there may be some additional learning that happens during the process. I know this gets technically super difficult, uh, but here you sort of get smoothness and sort of this fixed boundaries, et cetera, by the fact that kind of the drift is only determined by the scope and in expectation, independent of the level where I'm at, the process is the same. But it might be that as we go along, it becomes harder to create improvements or easier to create improvements. And that learning could influence the stopping decisions a little bit more. So these are just kind of, I really, as I spent time with it, I appreciated kind of how with these choices, you were able to distill the model into something so simple and tractable. And now I'm sort of just throwing it out there, stuff that you probably already thought about, but where I feel like you could start really talking to some of these more nuanced modeling choices and capture more of the richness that might be happening in uh, R&D processes like this. So uh, let me start from the tail end. <laughs> Sorry, that that one is actually something uh, we had been recently working on. Like in principle, we are doing this as a Brownian. Well, you could think there are actually two different Brownians with opposing drifts, which is what you would get experimentation along with search. So if I have, let's say, positive drift, I want to actually go to some place and go to another place. Uh, it turns out our techniques actually generalize, at least in the single player setting, to such problems as well. Although, even though that goes a little too technical for the talk in here, uh, if you go through the paper, what you would see is a difference is we write the problem in terms of the occupation measure. All you need to do is whatever process you think of, you want to think of the occupation measure it's going to impose on the costs and you optimize through that. I know this is a very vague answer and I apologize for that, uh, but this is useful in the sense that, for example, the two adding experimentation here means that you're actually looking at uh, an equivalent Brownian motion that's slowing down by itself. 
as opposed to just the Brownian motion that you control the variance, you're actually slowing the Brownian along with it. So that one is going to be a fairly, not easy extension, but a doable extension that we have been recently thinking about. Uh, adding, for example, different levels in terms of like a uh, absorbing boundary or a reflecting boundary or kind of a required level to pass, those also actually you can think of as, I'm going to have a Brownian motion that's going to have a reflecting boundary below, which also has a occupation measure that you can calculate and use, this, use similar techniques too. That one is actually not very nice to deal with. So in principle, you can write the problems, actually solving them gets fairly nasty just because you end up with all sorts of hyperbolic signs, cosines coming out through the problem. And finally, in terms of thinking about the public policy experimentations, uh, like another example you can really think about this is to just say different states are deciding on what kind of policies that they're going to make into law for the current pandemic. We might be sharing information, but once I actually write it into law, it's out there. So there is actually a, a clear relationship there as well, but it's kind of too current to actually map into here and there is different goals and stakes going through. So that one is not the running example we go through with. Right. Uh, have I answered or should I? Oh, please, proceed? please go ahead. Sorry, I, I took already too much time there. All right. So now let's describe the equilibrium. The equilibrium is going to be fairly simple. We're going to be choosing as an individual's best response problem. The individual knows what the sigma j's and tj's of the other players are. So they're going to just choose a stopping time and a control that's going to be Markovian, which is going to be best responses to each other. The wrinkle here is that uh, the tau ai and tau j's are actually those full families that you have in coming of all different potential alliances you can get. And sigma i's, we currently don't know. It's a stopping and control problem. So your uh, control should be related to your stopping and your uh, stopping should be related to control. Uh, but it turns out there is a quite easy and clear intuition to tackle this problem. First, when you look at just the control part, for any active agent I in any active alliance A, equilibrium search scopes are going to be constant. So those sigma i's that depend on a, m, and x actually only depend on a. So the path of the Brownian motion doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is who I am doing the search with. And when the solution is interior, it's going to be identified by a fairly simple system that depends on both the uh, cost per uh, variance as well as the margin of increasing the cost where you're going to equate this. Now, if you like squint your eyes a little bit and try to look at this, you'll see this is kind of looking like a system that would come out of a kernel where some of the search scopes is matched to some individual entities at every point in time. And it is indeed kind of the idea. Now, one thing also, if you look at the formula is that if the cost functions are log convex as opposed to convex, so we strengthen the assumption a little bit, when there is an interior solution, it's unique. Just because one side is going up, one side is going down, there's only a unique fixed point as sigma changes. Why is uniqueness useful? It allows us to actually do some comparative statics, which is kind of the expected comparative statics you would get. As alliances shrink, individual members search scope increase, whereas the total search scope is going to be decreasing. That is, if I'm doing the search, for example, with Liat and Doruk, I'll be kind of slacking off when the two of them are also working. But when Doruk says, okay, I'm done, I'm quitting, I'm just gonna be uh, implementing what I have found so far, then I'm going to increase my search scope a little bit. Same is true for Liat as well. But the total search scope we get is going to be actually less than the case where the trio had which is again, very Cournot-esque, if you would. Now, why is this happening? Uh, first thing is, remember, this was our goal. 
And one thing you might remember from the picture that I have shown over the uh, green and the black line is, the green line is usually flat and way above where the black line is. In principle, uh, if you're looking at the infinitesimal point in time, you're not really able to change the maximum if you're far away from it. And you might ask, well, what if I am actually right at the green line and the black line is meeting? That's the optical illusion part. The time you spend over there is approximately zero. So again, the infinitesimal impact is going to be zero. But then what are these agents trying to do? These agents are actually just trying to optimize their costs. Now you might be inclined to say that, why don't you just pick the lowest cost? If I take the lowest cost, I lower the CI at here, but it is going to have an impact on how fast I get to tau. So that is the thing that we are trying to optimize, not just locally minimizing costs, but we are actually trying to minimize cost per distance because we're trying to hit a stopping boundary. And in fact, that is exactly what, we, what the agents are trying to do. Increasing the scope is just speeding a Brownian path. You can actually just create a Brownian motion with uh, drift equal, uh, variance equal to one and think about whether we're running through these experiments fast or slow. All that each agent is trying to do is choosing an efficient speed. And once you actually fully go ahead and prove that this is what they do, you take the first order conditions with respect to these and you get the equilibrium outcome, even though we don't go through this way, but we jump through a few bit of hoops to actually get here. Now that we have the control though, we can actually try to say something about the stopping decision too. Stopping decision is going to have the following form. For each active alliance, each individual is going to have a boundary that is going to be a linear function. So just like the lines that I have shown you before. And that linear function is going to be dependent on the scope of the uh, alliance that is currently searching, as well as the agent in question's uh, cost while doing this uh, search with the alliance at hand. And when you look at this, you can see that since all of the agents have stopping boundaries of this form, you can see that agent I that has the minimal gap is going to be the one that is going to quit first. So uh, this behavior is generically unique. And what do I mean by generically unique? Like if we know, for example, Baruch is the first person to quit, then you can in principle change Liat's behavior because we know she's not going to be affecting the stopping decision. So the outcomes will always be unique, but you can generate some sort of trivial multiplicity by changing the behavior of people that don't matter at the time of decision making. Now, this kind of stopping boundary is also has a particular name, which is called a drawdown stopping boundary. Why is that? You stop the first time where the maximum and the current observation falls below a level. You draw down from your maximum at the level given by uh, this entity here. And uh, if I hit a drawdown, I'm going to stop. What if this drawdown is zero or negative? That just means you immediately want to stop. You're actually not trying to go back up. Now that we have the stopping boundary, the intuition for the stopping boundary is also fairly simple in this case. Just as I hinted with the graph, just consider an alternative problem where we shift the problem by k. Since the payoffs are linear, it means that if it is optimal to stop at m hat and x hat, then it should be optimal to stop at m t and x t. And these should differ exactly by the same amount. Why is this true? Because we know the search scope is independent of m and x themselves. So we can immediately deduce that that bit is not going to matter. But once you see that, you can actually see that we are going to have a drawdown. Now, the actual argument is a little bit involved, but this is an intuition, hopefully, kind of clear. Now, the final bit about the equilibrium behavior is the exit waves. How are exit waves forming in this equilibrium? 
We start with an alliance uh, A, and we pick who is going to stop. The agent who is going to stop is agent I, who has the smallest drawdown. That means we are currently at an observation that is uh, DI A below the current maximum. We know agent I is leaving. Then I'm going to say, this is the first agent that is leaving. What happens to the remaining agents? The remaining agents have an alliance that does not include agent I. But then that alliance is the members of the alliance is all I need to know to understand the stopping decision of all the members within that alliance as well as their search scopes. Using that, I can actually find who would have a drawdown that is less than the currently exiting agent once the agent I has left. But in that case, those agents, even though they might not want to leave if the current alliance were to continue, are willing to continue just because I has left. So they are going to be just joining I along in this way. And then I can ask, okay, I know I has left and some agents are going to join I because I has left. Uh, and I ask the same question again, who would like to join now this set Z one? I calculate the drawdowns again because I only need to know the identity of the players, the scopes and the level doesn't matter. But then I can also just continue iteratively until I either run out of people that are wanting to quit or run out of people that want to remain. So the entire actually alliance stops searching. And this gives us that the fact that the order of exits is deterministic. So ex ante, we straight up know who is going to quit in which order. And we also know who is going to join, who is not going to join. There is no randomness going on in between those. The thing that is random is how long it would take you to reach that particular drawdown. So the exit times are stochastic, even though the order is not. Now to see in uh, practice, like suppose we start with three agents and we observe XI as our path, our current maximum is somewhere around 33 or so. And at some level, agent one wants to quit. Then agent two might continue. They might reach a new high and they might actually hit a now larger drawdown because the peak is higher and the level is lower here. At this point, Agent two might want to quit, but agent one might still want to continue. And agent one might not hit another peak. So agent one is actually getting the same maximum as agent two, but uh, they would actually quit later just because their drawdown is going to be larger. Now this is all nice and good, and you can actually solve it starting from the initial alliance and solving it forwards, but Ideally, we wanna be able to say something a little more before even solving stuff. And to do that, like up to this point, we had completely heterogeneous agents. Their cost functions could be uh, very wacky and where their levels are could actually change quite a bit. One way to deal with that problem is just uh, simplifying the cost functions. We are going to assume that cost functions are going to be proportional to each other. And the way we write it is agent one is the most expensive agent. Agent N is the least expensive agent. So beta N is the largest number. But then when I consider the stopping boundaries, those were dependent on the uh, search scope plus divided by the individual cost. And individual search scopes was dependent on the cost divided by cost prime. One thing you can immediately see is when costs are proportional, all of the agents are going to choose the same search scope in an alliance. As the alliance changes, this chosen search scope changes. But if I am with identity of uh, like proportional people, the scope I choose is equal to the scope the other people choose. But this gives me that since the search scopes are identical and the total search scope is shared on the drawdown part, then I know at least weekly who is going to quit first, second, and third, by actually just looking at the agents who is most expensive. And in principle, the most expensive agent, which is going to have 
the search scope of the team divided by the search scope, the cost of their search scope is the agent to cost quit weekly first. Now this weekliness is not good enough. One thing we can actually do here is to try to see how are the exit waves forming? And this we can see. Now I know at least weekly the sets I need to consider are sets of the form one to 10, two to 10, three to 10, four to 10, five to 10, just because I know agent five will never quit before agent four. That's the only thing we buy from this proportional costs. But then I can ask, okay, let's just calculate the drawdown of agent one in one to 10, and then ask, what is the drawdown of agent two in two to 10? We see that it's below, so we know they are going to join agent one. Then we ask, what is the drawdown of agent three in three to 10? It's below, they're going to join them. Now we move on to agent four. Agent four has a higher drawdown. So we get our first wave just by that. Now you might say agent five drawdown from five to 10 was below agent one. But that is again, from the week order, we know agent five will never quit before four. So I actually just need to look going up. I know that five is only going to join four, but not one. And in principle, what we get is that the drawdowns you get is the upper envelope of those uh, drawdowns of those weekly ordered sets we get. Now, this is going to come quite useful when we talk a little bit about the social planners problem. But first, let me actually do a brief recap of the equilibrium. In the equilibrium, what we have found was the search scope only depended on the current alliance, doesn't depend on the outcomes. We have identified how to uh, calculate the endogenously occurring exit ways and in, in an even simpler manner if the order of the costs are well ordered. And finally, we see the behavior that you would expect. There is free riding as alliances shrink, each member chooses a higher search scope. And there's encouragement effect in the sense that the duration, the drawdowns are actually higher in a team as opposed to doing the solo search. Now, John, can, just, can I ask something? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm thinking about these exit waves when it's more than one agent exiting at the same time. If they had access to an identical Brownian sample path that they could continue the search along, uh, would, would they want to do that? Uh, would, would they want to form a sub-coalition that continues the search on their own? Actually, no, that's an excellent question. Uh, the equilibrium we find is also the unique point in the core of the scheme. So uh, I've, I'm hoping to talk about it till the end about how you can think of this welfare implications, but the quick answer is no. If you're quitting, you don't want to continue on your own. Thank you, because from reading the paper, I got the, the I understood that it's a statement that's true for one agent exiting, but I, I sort of missed the point about more than one. So thank you. Now, just to do a, a brief comparison to the case, we said Brownian is essential so that we get correlation because we thought this was the proper modeling choice. Uh, in fact, you can solve this problem with independent outcomes. So every day we sample from a normal with mean zero, variance chosen by the members of the current searching alliance. And we still keep track of the maximum of this normals and the rest of the rules apply. It turns out in that case, you actually get the reversal where instead of having drawdowns, you're going to have a satisfying threshold. I get something good enough, I'm going to stop. I don't really care. The second thing is, in that case, the order of exits is going to be stochastic. So uh, I will have a threshold, Turuk has a threshold, Liat has a threshold. One sample might cross all three of our thresholds where everyone is going to quit, or it might be the case that it only crosses mine but doesn't cross Turuk's or Liat's. So there's going to be some randomness going on. And finally, that randomness is going to make the entire problem very intractable because your control now is going to depend on the probabilities of different exits as well as the associated welfare on these random exits happening. So 
it turns out not only this correlation is kind of, at least to us, a better fit for application, it's also a much more tractable version of the same problem that you can think of. And it is allowing for extensions that Heike discussed a little bit. Now, let me talk about the social planners problem a little bit. In social planners problem, the social planner is going to choose a Marco policy because uh, our social planner is just solving a massive Marco decision problem. And again, uh, the states are going to be the same. And one thing we change over here is just to say, okay, now the social planner actually uh, is able to choose who is going to drop from Alliance A at a point in time, as opposed to individually assigning stopping boundaries. This is just notational convenience. There's a one-to-one -one mapping between the two. And the social planner chooses the search scope for all of the agents. The goal of the social planner is just now maximizing the sum of the welfares. But remember, this is a collaborative search. So there is a lot of, for example, benefit I give to my fellow searchers, even potentially at my own cost. So trying to solve this problem forward is going to get a little bit more tricky. In principle, you can try to solve it backwards. But at that point, when you try to solve it backwards, what is the last alliance? What are they doing? How that, that, did that become the last alliance? What would be the previous alliance? And you get this massive tree of different partitions of sets that you have at hand that the social planner needs to solve. But again, we start with the simple part, the search scopes. The search scopes of any alliance is going to be constant and only depends on the composition of the alliance. And whenever interior, they're going to solve this system now. Why is that? The intuition is fairly simple. Again, even for the social planner, you cannot actually change the maximum that much. You can actually change what is the positive externality you leave to the other agents by quitting later, but locally the change you can make is limited by the process, not by the alliances and their choices. So the social planner is now just minimizing the cost per distance, where the social planner correctly internalizes the externalities throughout the entire alliance, whereas an individual didn't have the sum in here. Again, when the costs are low convex, there is going to be a unique solution, and we get a reversal. In the social planner's problem, an individual searching by themselves has the lowest search scope. As you add more people, they're going to have more and more uh, larger search scopes. So in the full alliance, in equilibrium, I did my lowest effort. In equilibrium by myself, I did my highest effort. And in the social planners, I did my lowest effort alone. And I do my highest effort when I'm in the full alliance going through. Stopping boundary now is going to be a, a little more uh, difficult, but there is a particular thing. First, the sequence of alliances is going to be deterministic. So there is still no randomness in the order of the partition of the sets. But now, as I said, you actually need to think about all potential decreasing sequences of sets you can get. Turns out the stopping boundaries are again going to be governed by a drawdown, where the drawdown now looks into what is the relevant alliance that is following you. So it's not looking at the full backward uh, solution, but you're just looking one step ahead to see what am I leaving to the next alliance? Then the next alliance thinks about what are, what are they leaving to the next alliance and so on and so forth, which is captured by these terms in here. Now, to think about this though, once we actually have these drawdowns as well as the search scopes in here, we can actually, in principle, calculate the welfare. One thing we need to keep track of is that I, if I pick a random sequence of alliances, which is a random decreasing partition, then it might not be feasible because I might have a larger drawdown on a larger set, then the following set actually has time zero. They will just immediately stop before the other one. So we need the drawdowns to be increasing. But once we have a feasible sequence of alliances, we can actually write down the welfare in closed form. 
So the social planner's problem, you can actually reduce to saying, I'm just trying to find a decreasing partition of sets to maximize this thing. Well, it sounds easier than it is actually, because this is a combinatorial optimization problem over decreasing partitions. But we can try to get some intuition about it. And the intuition is going to come from starting something simple, just two people. Uh, and two Dan, people. Sorry, just remind you have around five minutes. Uh... Yes, I, I'm hopefully wrapping up. <laughs> uh, in case of uh, two agents, what you're going to have is that uh, adding an additional agent depends on whether they want to continue search alone or not. And in fact, in the case of two people, just that is enough. If the social planner finds it optimal for both agents to quit together, then it means that neither agent should have a higher drawdown. Whereas if the social planner wants, for example, agent one to exit first and agent two to exit, then this should be the order of drawdowns and this should be the order of drawdowns. So in two people, just feasibility is enough to tell you what the optimal sequence is. But when you go to three, that no longer works. Actually, if I start with, again, solo drawdowns and different set drawdowns, now I cannot compare because just the feasibility is not going to be enough. So it's, uh, if I have, for example, the drawdown of two, three that is larger than one, two, three, and drawdown of one, three that is larger than one, uh, one, three, just even comparing these two is not going to tell me which is the alliance that should follow. I actually need to look at the full problem. So this is kind of highlighting that two players search is actually very special. So moving from two to three is going to complicate our problem quite a bit. How do we get some traction on that? We again assume that we have well-ordered costs. And then in the well-ordered costs, the only sets we need to consider are those sets starting from K to up because we know weekly agent K plus one cannot stop before agent K just because their search scopes are again going to be identical. And the way to identify the optimal sequence, we're going to introduce one bit of notation where from going from set B to B prime is the drawdown when the alliance is B and the next alliance is B prime because in the social planner, we actually needed to take care of who is the following uh, set. And if it's no one, then we denote it by the empty set. Then we can find the optimal sequence by the following algorithm. We look at all those drawdowns going to zero and pick the maximal one. Call that maximizer L1. And now we're going to say this is the last uh, alliance. And the penultimate alliance is going to be the sets that are going to be reducing to our L1, which is going to be the L2. And you go inductively until you actually reach the first set, the full set. Why is this actually working? Again, looking at the picture and combining our intuition is helpful. If I look at the drawdown from seven to the empty set, I know that eight, nine, or 10 will have no incentive to search through. This might actually kind of answer Ariada's earlier question graphically as well, but in the more general case, you only consider all different potential following sets. The drawdowns of these sets are already reached when seven is willing to stop. So they're going to join seven. But once we know seven is going to be the last set, we ask who is going to be the set that is going to precede seven. And we end up with B4. And then we can go back by B1. So again, we're looking at the upper envelope of those drawdowns that is going to tell us what the order of the stopping boundaries are. To recap, the social planner solution was uh, the case that there was higher search scope and longer search durations. And uh, the stopping boundary now actually is going to be weakly the same, but they might actually be completely different. Uh, I would like to just show a brief picture of what can happen since I'm kind of out of time. In a partition where we have 
well-ordered costs. So all the costs are the same, just the betas are different. Beta one is one, beta two is something larger than one, beta three is larger than beta three. So agent three is the cheapest, agent one is the most expensive. In a set of parameters where the social planner wants to actually group all of the agents together, in equilibrium, you can have all different kinds of behavior. You can have one, two, three in sequence. You can have one, two, then three, one, then two, three, or one, two, three, just like the social planner wants. Now, I don't have time to discuss this, unfortunately, unless someone asks in the question or answers, but the, uh, the extension to later innovations follows similarly for the search scopes. The only thing that changes is the stopping boundary for the following teams, because now they're not getting M, but they're getting alpha M, wherever alpha is the discount for getting a later payoff. And hopefully this was a tractable model of doing collective search in a team. Uh, as Heike highlighted, there, it's actually quite tractable to extend to different versions of this problem too, where you can actually incorporate I don't know, maybe discounting. Maybe you want to actually think about forming optimal team composition. What, what is that? Because this setup, you can say, you know what, I want to co-author with, let's say, uh, Ariada. Then I actually know we're going to do a joint search together. I know the welfare associated, given my cost and Ariada's cost. I know how much effort she's going to exert. I know how much effort I'm going to exert. I also know what's going to be the net payoff I'm going to get and the net payoff, for example, she's going to get. You can actually use this as a basis of, I don't know, matching uh, PhD students to their advisors. What is their outcome going to be to the student, to the agent, to the overall welfare? You might actually think of larger teams where you're going to have actually a core and use this as a baseline for that kind of model. Finally, you can actually introduce monetary transfers as long as you're doing search, I give you some payments, maybe I contract with you. And it's going to be just changing the local cost. You're flatly changing the cost itself because we know it, it is completely independent of the search, the rest of the search history. It is fairly easy to extend into a contracting setup as well. And with that, I'm, I think, two, three minutes over. I apologize for that and I leave the floor <laughs> for questions. Uh, thank you very much, Dan. Um, I don't know if the, our panelists have any questions or comments first before we open to everyone else. Uh, well, I would have two little uh, points that I would like to kind of bring up. Uh, the first one is if there would be a way, because the tractability is attractive, but one thing that conceptually struggled a little bit with the fact that because it's a uh, just a unidimensional problem where the payoff is basically a public good, then kind of we have a situation where if we have N players, the best thing to do is to have all N players in that one team because of the positive externality. So the biggest team is always the best, even with kind of the free riding incentives. How might we be able to change this in a way that we could in a meaningful meaningful way talk about should we all work on one thing or should we have sub teams that are exploring multiple different avenues um kind of being able to contrast uh let the thousand flowers bloom versus this is the path that we're doing and we're all jointly working on it what these trade-offs depend on just thinking in terms of the structure of the model and the payoffs and then the second question is just in the paper and also in the presentation, if you can uh, talk a little bit more about what are the exact welfare effects of potentially wanting to change the timing of exit beyond kind of the, as people stay in longer, that's good for everybody in terms of which types of players are most valuable to be kept longer and what's kind of the logic behind that if there is one, uh, that's kind of the two, like the more nuanced economic intuition behind the welfare effect. And then the, can we ever get a setting where we have 10 teams of five instead of one team of 50? 
So again, I would like to start from the second one because that one is something uh, we have been thinking. Like uh, right now, you, you're actually kind of thinking about the search scope as an additive form, right? One thing you can actually think of it as, what if we actually vote on that? Instead of doing that, as long as we're doing the search together, we're going to actually have a joint company policy that tells us what we should be doing as part of our search, but it's a company. I don't like it, I quit. I can actually just implement whatever I get at that point. You might wanna actually say, if I quit before other people quit, you might give me like some discount for it, which is fairly easy to do, which is going to be just closer to this extension, which I didn't have time to talk about. Uh, but then you can actually ask, uh, now we're talking about the welfare implications of different kinds of aggregating search scopes where we are jointly voting on it or we're just adding to it. Maybe it's a, a continuous uh, like random function. The other way to think about the welfare is, again, suppose we're looking at uh, just the pairing. Again, let's think about, for example, you and me are thinking about pairing. And what's going to be is, are we left to equilibrium or are we left to, let's say, the social planner choosing our search scopes or the social planner telling us when we quit as opposed to leaving our search scopes free. In all of those scenarios, uh, actually not in here, but you see that in equilibrium, you would want someone that's going to work longer than you, but not necessarily you would want someone that's going to be harder working or not just because we didn't make any particular convexity assumptions on the cost because both the level and the margin comes in. But if you have a particular form in mind, and I think we had it at some point in the paper, I don't know if we cut it or not, you can actually do comparative statics as to say, would you like to have, for example, positive assortative matching between these people and what's the resulting welfare? Or would you like to have negative assortative matching and what's the resulting welfare? And more importantly, what parts of the social planner choosing the behavior and what parts of equilibrium is going to lead to positive assertive matching versus negative assertive matching. Like, unless I misremember and uh, it might be in the paper or it might have been cut out, like equilibrium is positive assertive matching whereas social planner is negative assertive matching. Uh, and you can actually pin down the components. Out of space constraints, I think we cut it out or it might be delegated in the online appendix, but they're like much larger questions. When we started trying to solve those, we figured out there is quite a bit, like the core part moving on to that was also quite interesting to go through. And hopefully it will be followed through in future. Like the model is flexible enough that you can deal with these problems. Just out of space constraints, they're not in here. If you find earlier versions on the web, you will find them somewhere in online. Or if you wait a little bit, probably it will come through. Now, going through in having multiple people running through, there are two ways to tackle this problem. One is to say, uh, I start with one Brownian, there's another Brownian, and these don't interact, and you actually have different paths going through. Then on expectation, the maximum of the social, the resulting outcomes, you can actually calculate separately. And those ones actually are going to say the largest team is better. But if you wanted to do, for example, two Brownians running in parallel, and at the time you stop, you're not only getting the maximum, but you're getting the point-wise maximum of the Brownian. That's a slightly more difficult problem that I have been working on, but it's a work on progress. So uh, that's a that's on the agenda, it's similar in techniques because all of those are going to be essentially uh, stopping ground in motions. And that's actually where, for example, the knowledge of the time changed Brownians are coming through, but uh, not in this paper, unfortunately. I don't know if this second part was a good answer, but I think hopefully the first one was. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I also had a couple of points. Um, this is very nice. And one of my favorite parts about the paper is the well, the case of well-ordered costs, because I think it gives a, a sort of a nice vis visualization of the of the exit waves and then how they vary. 
Um, one, there's a, a point that you make in the paper and that perhaps I missed in the talk about how uh, changing the betas will change the pattern of these exit waves. And in particular, you say that if the costs are closed, then it's likely that agents will, will exit together. Uh, and sort of prompted by that remark and the, the comparative statics you do in beta one and beta n, I'm wondering whether there is a way to formalize the, uh, the, the something, a, a statement along the lines that uh, the more heterogeneous the costs within a team, the less likely the clustered exits are because people will tend to, to exit one by one if, if the betas are far apart from each other. So I'm wondering if you've thought at all about uh, some measure of how to link heterogeneating costs to the likelihood of, of uh, of these clustered exits. And going back to the example that you're giving about the industry, GM and Ford and all of that, that would be sort of a nice um, conjecture to, to be tested empirically as well in the, in the sort of heterogeneity of these industries. Um, the second point that I wanted to make is actually, I think related to uh, Heike's point as well uh, uh, about uh, uh, agents searching different, uh, different potentially different things or different aspects. Um, so within the unidimensional world that you have, I was thinking about uh, a notion of specialization in which some agents are better at just searching some parts of the terrain and others are better at searching other parts of the terrain, but they have to sort of wait until their, their portion of the terrain comes so that they can, they can search that. So I, I guess I'm just wondering whether you thought generally about notions of specialization within within the model and how to model that with these cost functions? Uh, so for the specialization for particular parts of the terrain, uh, honestly, we haven't thought about this, uh, but uh, what you're suggesting is, unless I misunderstood, like in this world, it's going to be at different parts in time. If I have lived that point, my cost is going to have a change because I, we hit my specialization point. And then if we have moved a little forward in time, now we hit another specialization point where I'm going to actually continue. This yes, something along that lines. And perhaps there is a cost of waiting as well, right? While I wait for my turn to come in. Uh, although, so we haven't thought about this just on the spot. Uh, this is going to add a fourth dimension to the problem where we actually have to take time itself as the uh, state. Uh, in principle, though, if it's like fixed amounts of time, not that we have waited a random amount of time, but we are in the region that between time five and 10, I expect similar search scope results to come through. Now it's going to depend on A and T. Like it's going to be independent of the Brownian motion, but this is going to be dependent on A and T itself, uh, like just not just A, but this is speculation. So don't take it to heart. Now for the comparative statics, I didn't have time to show it. And uh, I realized I haven't sent you the online appendix, but there is a bunch of graphs that actually does the comparison across different data. Now, if you look at this picture, this is the case like beta one is one, beta two is a number, beta three is a number. And we're looking at above the 45 degree line because we know beta three is larger than beta two. So for example, if all are close to one, we see that uh, in equilibrium, they're going to bunch through. Now we make, for example, beta three larger, whereas beta two is close to still the origin. Like the closer to the origin means all of your costs are fairly similar. If you go just straight up, that means beta three is increasing. And if you go this way, both beta two and beta three is increasing in this graph. So this is telling you like, if you increase beta three substantially, three is going to drop by themselves, but two and one are going to actually join together. We made three significantly cheaper. So they actually want to continue after one and two quits. And similarly, if the costs are far enough, like we are far away from the origin and we are far away from the 45 degree line. We see that uh, agents are actually going to drop sequentially in equilibrium. Whereas if we get closer to the 45 degree line, but we are farther away from the origin, which means two and three are similar, so they group. 
but one is not. Like there's a bunch of calculations and the way to calculate those in the online appendix. And it actually goes through all potential solutions of the social planners as well. But it's in the online appendix. Uh, I apologize, I haven't sent you that. And I think there's just this one picture in the main text. <laughs> But it is something we had thought through, and it is actually something well worth investigating further into for applications in general. Okay, thank you. Uh, do we have any questions from uh, anyone else? I have one. If we have time, if we don't have time, I can save it. Yeah, yeah, we have time, yes. Okay, I was thinking of the basic interpretation of the model and uh, Maybe I just don't understand it very well, but I don't find any natural interpretation of the main variables here. So if we think about the valuation of the process, it's um, um, Brownian motion and the cost integral. So obviously the Brownian motion goes down. So that's, that's also a cost somehow, right? So we usually model things with Brownian motions uh, for good reasons like uh, stock prices because they incorporate information and so forth or populations in biology or but the idea here is what I'm, what I'm trying to say is your sigma makes your project valuation go up and down right uh, so the reason it goes down somehow is because some cost is incurred or at least uh, people realize that the value is not as high right but you have on top of that the cost function which has some good reasoning behind it. So now I'm wondering what exactly is that X or that M? So the natural interpretation that you hint at is uh, perhaps sort of the, the underlying state of nature that we get to observe by search. But in that case, why does it go down? Why is it that after we research for a while, the value of my project is going down? It shouldn't be going down. We just didn't find anything. Uh, I, I, I do incur the cost of search, but it's not like I, I forgot how to build my Volvo or whatever, right? So uh, what are, my question, like my, let, let me make it into a question. A, a more specific and clear interpretation of what those X's are would be very helpful to me. Can you provide something like that? Uh, sure, uh, let me try, hopefully uh, it will work. So the, uh, X you can think of as the outcome, like you're building your Volvo uh, or like uh, you're trying to come up with like some lighter material that's not full steel. You don't know what it is. And at this point, let's say two is the case where you actually have 2% aluminum in it. It's now a lighter material, but you also need to make sure that it's going to actually be A, cheaper to produce, uh, B, it's going to be like commercially viable, it's going to be safe and all so on and so forth. Now the value of the Brownian motion, you can think of it the uh, accumulated like the sum of those components, the total profitability, if you will, and you have, let's say 2% of uh, aluminum in there. Now, when you move to- Wait, wait, wait. Let, me, let me stop you here because this is, the, this is the root of the problem for me. So it's not actually the knowledge that we accumulate from some kind of shared uh, outside process that dictates the, the state of the world. It's how my Volvo actually turns out, which is, I understand why that may go in value. Like I put too much aluminum, uh, my uh, safety ratings uh, go down the toilet. Uh, people don't like mm -hmm. Volvos anymore because they bought it for the safety, right? I, I get that. But then we're talking about a particular uh, building, a particular process, an actual plant that does something that we built a certain way that may or may not generate value. Or, and then I understand why it's a Brownian motion. Okay. But this is not the, the story that we, we got with the paper. Does that make sense what I'm, what I'm pointing at here? Because if it's about the knowledge, our knowledge, shared knowledge of the world, that doesn't go down, right? We just don't find new knowledge. Uh, I mean, you can think of this as like what is out there. It's not that you forgot how to do your Volvo as you are, which is why you're keeping track of your maximum. So it's just saying that, okay, the Brownian motion, I added aluminum, it's now not cost efficient or it's, not no, it's no longer actually good. What I have found out is that, well, actually this percent is not good. What I can do is 
I can try to add more aluminum. Maybe it's going to become cost efficient or it's going to be light enough that it's not going to crush people inside. So my safety ratings go back up. But what I keep track in mind is not just the Brownian motion itself. The maximum is the fact that you never forget what is the way to do the thing best. So okay, whatever so I have found. X, so what's X specifically? What, what is X? X is the value of the outcome of the search currently in the sense of adding, let's say, 4% aluminum, how commercially viable it is. The value of Your the best search option, for what? Is it knowledge or is it a specific state of matter? Like, a, like my plant, my, my car, my... Uh, so I'm, I'm trying to figure out why it goes down. So I'm, I'm not going to bother you after this. I'm trying to figure out why does X go down? Is, it's a very simple question for me. Uh, it's just that maybe you add too much aluminum into your car and it's now too expensive to build it. So if you were to actually implement that particular X, that's actually going to reduce your payoff. But you also keep track of the best kind of mixture already, which is the maximum process in there. So actually you don't forget. What you do is you're running a series of experiments. You can actually think of trying different recipes for cooking too. I add a little bit of salt, maybe it makes it better. I add a bunch of salt, it's going to make it worse. But what I do is after cooking for, I don't know, three, four years, I actually know what the recipe is. This X process is just telling me, as I change salt, what are the tastes that I'm getting? I'm not necessarily getting a flow payoff for these Xs, which might be the case that I'm not actually building bad cars. Still, what I'm going to be building is the best car that I have, I'm at the process of taste tasting, if you will, or like coming up with the right recipe. I'm searching for the optimal compound, if you will. Uh, like this is kind of frequently used in other papers too, although I don't think that's a valid defense, uh, but calendar also has the same thing. You can think of this as different policies for your government, uh, for your, I don't know, firm. Maybe you think, okay, if we do, uh, what the casual Fridays, productivity goes up. If you do casual every day, people don't even show up to work. So it actually goes down. But then you actually do casual every day, but work from home and you need to be logged into Zoom and I see your face, then it actually goes back up. And at some point you're going to say, this is our company policy and you implement it, which is the best one you think. So these are actually, this is kind of, you can think as Arya's earlier question was. These are just some ordering of policies. And what you learn is how effective they are as you go along. So it's not time or like directly payoff itself since the payoff is the maximum, not the X. Okay, thanks for the detailed answer. Uh, maybe we should stop the recording now and then uh, chat for a few minutes uh, before we close. Uh, thanks a lot for the um, for the really interesting talk and uh, the panelists for the nice comments and, and the audience and also the uh, the co-authors for answering I think it was a very li uh, lively chat section.